Hello everybody. As you may have noticed, I am a bit of a leftist. And a thing us leftists like to do is talking about the working class. Which begs the question, who is working class? It's a surprisingly complicated answer, so I made this 17-ish minute video to hopefully clear things up. Let's start off with history. Historically, class used to be immensely important in determining the way your life would go. For example, if you were to be a slave in the Roman Empire, that would make you part of the slave class. And the membership in that class would significantly impact the way your life could go. You're probably aware that we now theoretically have class mobility. So the impact of class on your life is in theory a lot lower. Anyone can make it, as they say. As a leftist I have reservations about that, but let's just continue. Class can mean very many things in many places and in many parts of history, but in general a class is a group of people who are commonly associated or who have common interests or features. An example of a class would be the medieval nobility, which was associated with being landowners and taxing the poor, which had the common interest to keep the people pacified and the common feature that they were all born into nobility. We will focus on the common interests for now. They are called class interests. For example, it is in the class interest of the medieval nobility to tax the peasantry. That means it would be of advantage for every individual member of the noble class to do. This does not mean that the nobles don't have the freedom to do whatever, or that they are possessed by some sort of hive mind in the form of a class. It just means that by being part of that class, they have incentives which create class interests. Like again, taxing subjects so they can have more money. That's a class interest of the nobility. That doesn't mean that all nobles will tax the peasants a lot. It just means that it's in their interest to do it. On the other hand, the peasants don't have such class interests because they don't have anyone they can tax. That means that different classes have different class interests. Now that we have examined the basics of classes, we can have a look at how class is seen nowadays. That means I'm primarily explaining the neoliberal view right now. Let's start off with the question, how many classes are there? Most people who have gone to a business school as well as everyone on TV will tell you that there are three classes in our economy. That is the upper class, the middle class and the lower class. That is the modern consensus of what classes exist. Classes have become only an unofficial system in our modern day. As you know, this isn't feudalism, class mobility exists. That means you can't switch classes, so they are a lot less important than they could be. Which class you're part of is mostly determined by your individual wealth. That means the worth of all of your stuff plus the money in your bank account minus all of the debt you have. That means a millionaire like Donald Trump is upper class and a McDonald's cashier or an unemployed person would be considered lower class. In this case that is due to them probably not being very wealthy. But there is another way to be considered lower class and that is to have a low prestige jobs. Those jobs are usually very physically demanding but easy to learn which often but not always makes them badly paid. Examples could include industrial workers and miners. You know, all of the jobs you wouldn't want to do because they are hard and the working conditions are bad. And even if a coal miner makes lots of money, as unionized workers tend to do, they would still be seen as lower class just because the job is seen as such. I mentioned the upper class and the lower class now, the only thing left is the middle class. And theoretically everyone who isn't low or high class is middle class. That means, for example, a bank teller is middle class, a teacher is middle class, and so is the junior assistant security officer at your local Walmart. The middle class is not as well off as the upper class, but they're still a lot closer than the lower class. Typically, you'd assume the middle class to be able to own their own homes, to find an alright office job, to found a family and so on. If you've heard about it, the American dream is pretty much how you can imagine the middle class. Let's talk about the history of how it came to be like this. The typical story says that a long time ago humans lived in tribes and naturally built different classes like that from ownership of land. To skip over a lot, later medieval peasants were a thing and around the 1800s the peasants revolted and created a new system of land ownership. That was the end of feudal land ownership. Uh, they introduced capitalism in which everyone can own land provided they're wealthy enough to buy it. But crucially they forgot to take all of the wealth from the feudal landlords so the old nobility, or at least some of them, began buying all of the land including the farmland which the farmers were just given as part of the revolution. 
then the industrial revolution started and there are two classes, the upper class and the lower class. The upper class, which descended from the feudal nobility, quickly bought all of the land and founded factories to make the lower class work on it in their conditions. The lower class had to work hard and they were miserable. At this time, work usually lasted something like 12 to 18 hours a day, seven days of the week, with barely enough payment to get through a week. This class was naturally seen as very poor and exploited. And because they were the people doing the work and making the machines run and digging up coal, they were called the working class. And those bad jobs from the Industrial Revolution are still oftentimes seen as lower class today. So now we have found the upper and the lower class, but we're still missing the middle class in between. There are two different stories about how it came about and one goes that eventually the members of the upper class realized that paying the workers more means that they can buy the products they make. Uh, an example is Ford who produced cars for the rich and then discovered that mass production and livable wages would result in his employees buying his product. The other version is that workers unionized and demanded better pay and working conditions which eventually allowed them to afford luxuries which had previously been out of reach of the working class. Which version you believe can depend on your political positions, most likely it was a bit of both. Unionized workers and economic self-interest of the capitalists. Anyway, from a combination of well-paid workers and cheap mass-produced products, the middle class was born. If you ever heard about the 50s in the USA, you know that it was a relatively good time because many families were able to move from the lower class to the middle class and some even managed to become part of the upper class. So this is a typical three class system you will see in most neoliberal economies and societies. And upon being asked, most will tell you about these three classes. However, there are some who disagree. Some who say that the three classes are arbitrary and shouldn't be used. And that the dialectical two-class system would make more sense. Those people are Marxists. In the Marxist view of the present-day classes, there are two, bourgeoisie and proletariat. The bourgeoisie fits roughly on the position of the upper class from the neoliberal model, while the working class now includes everyone but the rich. But why is that? Isn't that just a way to break economics into a simple us versus them narrative? Not quite, though it can have that effect, but that's not the intention. The crucial difference is in the way which these classes are defined. As I mentioned before, the current model defines class by wealth. The Marxist one does it by dialectics. So what's that? Uh, dialectics is a philosophy, a way of looking at the world or a framework to help you explain things. And Marxism uses it to understand, explain and define classes. Let's learn a bit about dialectics before we continue talking about the classes. Essentially, dialectics is a way to understand and predict some things based on contradictions. That means we have a look at some unit or something and analyze the different forces in it. And in theory, this can be used to create classes or predict where things are headed in the future. This is very abstract, so let's get an example. We have a five-person family, a father, a mother and three NB children. And we, as observers, want to figure out where they will go in their holidays. They have the choice between a water park and a cinema. To use typical statistical methods would mean we'd gather data on the family, see what their mean income is, what their education is like, what the parents work as, what school the oldest child goes to, as well as the weather information and so on. And we can use all these statistics together with previous data to form an educated guess on which choice they will statistically make. And if we have enough data, our guess will be accurate. In dialectics, you take another approach. Instead of having a look at outside data or something like that, we look at the inside of that unit. We look at the groups within it, and in our case, two parents and three children. And if we look closely, we may learn that the mother and two children want to go to the water park, and the father and one child might want to go to the cinema. And if we know these contradictions or these different desires of the members of the family, we can make a pretty good guess about what they will do in the future. In this case, it is going to the water park. But why use dialectics? Our statistical model worked just as well, right? Yes, but the difference lies within the data you need. For the statistical option, you need lots of data on everything. And you're most likely going to get that by observing the thing you want to predict. In our case, that's families making that choice. But to make a good prediction, you'd have to observe that choice many times, which means you need lots of outside data. For dialectics, you just need a good understanding of the internal workings of the thing you want to analyze. 
This is particularly important if you don't have observational data about the thing you want to predict. For example, if we wanted to have a look at society, dialectics could be useful. After all, we have no data on what statistically happens to inhabited planets like ours in the information age. But if we apply dialectics to our society, we might get an idea of where things are headed. So basically, dialectics is the only model we can use because it handily works without outside data. So all we need to do is have a good look at our society and the contradictions in it, and we can try to make some sort of prediction about it. So we must try to find some opposing forces. What kind of contradictions can we find in our current society? Your first thought may be a racial division, uh, that this society is in a struggle between different races. This is oftentimes the gut reaction, especially if you watch right-wing news, but it doesn't really hold up if you have a closer look at it. Think about it. What's the difference between you and someone of another race? How are you different? L let's take a stereotypical Mexican. What do they want? Well, to have a livable life, good wages, low rent, police that doesn't murder them, as well as freedom to practice their culture and religion and so on. And what are your interests, assuming you're one of the 4chan anti-foreigner types from the USA? Well, it's all the same stuff. Uh, high pay, low rent, the working police force, as well as the freedom to practice your culture and religion. Do you see what I mean by it doesn't hold up? Uh, based on this, we can't find a contradiction. I guess we could pull a Prager U and yell culture war. Uh, we could say that Mexican traditions and our traditions are not compatible and that you can't have both. And if that was true, I would still not be convinced. After all, there doesn't have to be conflict here. Like, you can celebrate Thanksgiving and your neighbor can celebrate Cinco de Mayo, but neither stops the other. Like, you can have both happening in parallel. These two things don't need to clash and they only do when you make them. In dialectics, we want to search for a conflict which is always ongoing, which cannot be ignored and which cannot stop. And no culture war or racism fits that. So what does? What contradiction can we find in our modern society? Let's have a look at what our two people want again, shall we? Um, seems like both of them wanted high wages, low rent and the working police. But that makes us wonder, if this is in the interest of both of us, why don't we have it? And the answer is that there are other people who have opposing interests. Some people want to pay low wages and drive rent up really high and make sure the police isn't too nice to the people. And who is that? Depends. For the rent, it's landlords. They want high property values to make more money. For the wages, it's the bosses. They will take any excuse to pay workers less so they can make more money. And there are certain people in the government who have an interest in allowing the police to use tear gas on peaceful protesters to make sure their position isn't ever too threatened. So we can divide society like this. On the one side, we have people like you and me, people who have a job and rent a place to live, and our interests are high wages and low rent. And on the opposite, we have landlords and employers whose interests are low wages and high rent. And crucially, this conflict can't just be paused. It's always ongoing. You cannot escape and it happens everywhere. It's always in their interest to increase rent and it's always in your interest to reduce it. These two factors in this dialectical model are the classes Marxism recognizes. On the one hand, we have people who are so wealthy in money and land that they themselves don't need to do physical labor anymore, but instead rent out their land or employ employees to work on their behalf. To use the Marxist word, these people live off their capital, so they are capitalists. And on the other hand, we have people like you and me, people who don't have enough money to start a business or buy flats for renting out, so we have to get a job, work for a wage in a factory or workplace of a capitalist. Yes, technically we can start our own business, but good luck out competing mega businesses. You're going to fail and end up in a lot of debt. So really, your only choice as member of the non-capitalist class is to work for a capitalist. And because we make our money by working rather than owning, we're called the working class. And we will struggle. Uh, we will ask for a raise because it's in our interest and the boss will try to deny it because that's in their interest. And we will seek low property values so we can afford to live a life while our landlord will try to increase property value. This is called the class struggle, by the way. The two groups are struggling to implement their class interests. And those are the two classes in Marxism. They are the two groups who have different interests in our current society. So the Marxist answer to the question, how many classes are there, would be to say two. And those are capitalist and working class. 
There is the answer to the title. Everyone who makes their money by working rather than owning capital is part of the working class. This can of course get fuzzy in the middle. If you, for example, rent out a flat you inherited and work a regular wage labor job. But in general, those two classes are pretty distinct. Oh, and yes, that means that millionaire actors are working class. Remember, this is based on how you make your money, not how much you make or how much you have. And now I've technically answered the question from the beginning. But I mentioned before, dialectics can be used to help us predict the future by looking at contradictions. And I think now that I've gone through the process of explaining these contradictions, I may as well tell you where we're headed. After all, that's what dialectics is for. So let's have a look at the relationship between work and capitalists in the workplace. What do either of them give to the production process? Well, the worker gives the employer their labor and time and the employer provides raw material and machines to work as well as pay for the employee. Now, if we have a look at that payment through a Marxist lens, it's inherently exploitative for reasons I explained in this video. Um, if you don't believe that, that's fine for now. Just remember that the employer is financially incentivized to pay the employee as little as possible, which makes it likely for them to offer an unfair deal. That's in their class interest after all. So if we look at what either of these people give, we can see that the employee is providing all productive labor, where the employer is only providing things that can be bought. And crucially, that means that the employer cannot make money without the employees working for them. But the other way around, there is no reason the employees couldn't work without the employer, provided they somehow managed to get financially independent from the capitalist. After all, the employees could manage their workplace perfectly well via democracy. The only reason they're not doing it is because they're lacking the capital. Because if they had the capital to start a business and live off that, they would be capitalists. So from a Marxist perspective, there are two ways this society can progress. Either the capitalists will remain in power indefinitely, always trying to take advantage of the majority and never getting removed. Or one day, the workers have enough of the class struggle, overthrow the capitalists, seize the businesses and run them on their own without capitalists. And a business run by workers without capitalists is by definition socialist. Those are the two options. And taking that, so far no economic system has lasted forever, I would bet that one day capitalism will fall in favor of socialism. And that's why socialists sometimes say that socialism is inevitable. Because it's either that or this system built on conflict will never change. And I'd say at some point this conflict has to be resolved. Thanks for watching, please like and subscribe and such. I usually upload once a week, though I can't promise that I'll keep that in the near future. I've got a lot going on right now. Um, I'd like to thank my patrons for giving me motivation in the form of money. And I'd like to especially thank Darius the Bird, Noah, Herdington Gerdington, Joey, Klaastrup, Morally Conflicted Tortoise, Spear, Tyler Dang, Generalist77 and Aaron J. Patton for their generous donations.